Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Good Old Podcast. I'm Jack for Andrew Lee for Wahoo's 24 7. I hope you everyone has had a good holiday. You're all refreshed and had some good times with your families. Um, so, obviously, a lot has happened since our last podcast where we talked a little bit about where things stand with the transfers because Virginia was able to pick up two more and things are about to heat up once again. But before we get started, why don't you go ahead and like this video, like this channel, so you'll be able to see whenever we have a new video by clicking on the bell. And also, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to wherever you listen to your podcast so you'll see when the new episode is posted. Um, on this week's episode, we're going to talk a lot about recruiting because we didn't really have a, a big sum up show of where things stand with Virginia as far as with, with Brian Doan on the show. And we're actually, Brian's going to be coming on the show here after the break to kind of talk about where things stand. Um, and give it his thoughts to some of the guys in state that he's seen uh, play. So give it his thoughts on guys like Cameron Courtney, who is a late addition to the class, but also his thoughts on the transfers because there was a number of former Virginia in-state players that he was able to watch as high schoolers who are now part of Virginia's class, like Thomas Dales, Chris Tyree. So um, Brian is going to share his thoughts. And just to kind of kick things off, Virginia is going to be very active. They're going to be hosting three transfers starting on Thursday. We know one uh, publicly, which is Gavin Frakes, which is a quarterback from New Mexico State. He's originally from Oklahoma. He'll be visiting from the fourth to the sixth. So he is definitely one to watch next couple games, uh, next couple of days. I will say he's under commitment watch um, at Wahoo's 24-7 as we uh, kind of look forward to his visit. Uh, for the next few days, if he picks up that offer on that trip. A and when it comes to other guys that we're monitoring, we're monitoring a few guys, including a tight end um, out of Air Force that is in, in the portal. Um, Virginia is actively recruiting him, but Virginia is also very active with a number of DBs because they're not only want to get a maybe like two or three cornerbacks uh, before all this is over with. They also want to add a quarterback, a tight end, possibly a linebacker. Um, either from the high school ranks or in the portal, they're just looking for the right fit. So several different options for Virginia, several different positions that they are recruiting. So um, we're going to take a quick break. and But then when we get back, um, Brian Doan is going to break down a few things uh, that he has seen from this class and what he likes. <laughs> And welcome back to the Good Old Podcast. We're talking about recruiting today. Um, in the little bit, in the introduction to the show, we talked a little bit about what positions Virginia is recruiting moving forward. But before we kind of talk about moving forward, we're going to look back a little bit to see where Virginia stands and kind of what some of the things we liked in the class that they signed in December, but also some of the transfers that they over to bring in, especially with the new additions of both Trail Harris and, De and Andre Green. Both of them committing just before the holiday seasons, about Friday, right before Christmas. And then the day on the 23rd, uh, Trail Harris was also able to announce that Virginia had a uh, a couple good days right before Christmas, some early Christmas presents for this staff. So a lot of things to talk about. So I am joined today by recruiting extraordinaire from the East region, Brian Doan, who covers a lot of our Recruiting on 24-7 sports uh, has a lot of information, not only in the East region, but across also the transfer portal. Brian, I know you've had a busy time the last few weeks, but you took a deservedly day, a couple days off. So glad to for you to come on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's nice to uh, actually reacquaint myself with family after signing day. So that was nice. Yes, yes. The days, the, the week between Christmas and New Year's, I feel like a lot of us took some uh, much needed days off turning off our phones for a bit yeah and I, i'll tell you what you know who i feel like well, i shouldn't say i feel bad for because they made their own bed but the coaches who are going to get back on campus this weekend and start hosting transfer official visitors now i say i only feel bad a little bit because all we hear about is this calendar and how packed it is and how they don't have time to do anything with signing day and bowl games for a lot of programs and transfer portal and yo man this is the bed you made so you can't really complain about it this is this is what they all wanted with transfers and being eligible and 
if you want to push for that signing day in the summer, then do it. But they don't want to give back July as vacation time. So this is where we're all at. Yeah, which means while they're juggling contact period with high school guys in December, in-home visits for high school guys, you're also meeting and uh, greeting transfers like a speed date. You know, it's crazy, John. It's, it's funny you say that because remember back in the day, it used to be like, okay, when is the head coach doing his in-home with player X, Y, and Z, right? Mm-hmm. And right. And so you were trying to chart to see how it got all lined up. And that didn't happen a ton. And what happened is coaches just stayed on campus because they had to recruit players to stay in their program for retention or they had to, you know, bring in a couple transfers, right? Because even though the transfers, you know, they're not really bound to anything until they start a class, but a lot of the transfers wanted to get things wrapped up before the holidays. So they were trying to get things done too. So it's the craziness is, is, deserved to be honest yeah i mean it's it's crazy how one of the virginia's biggest victories is keeping brian stevens their center at virginia by recruiting him during this offseason and you think you have that battle at home because he might want to go to nfl draft or go into portal and then you have other things going on too and it's just you have to juggle a, a lot of things and it's not over yet because you have granted the portal is closed now But you still have that spring portal, so you still have that thread looming. And Virginia, um, there was a was a you know last year had Cam Kelly on campus in the spring and went through spring practice and entered in the spring portal, went to Louisville. So it's a crazy time for college football. It it is, and the other thing with that, Jackie, is, I mean, I'm I'm sure people aren't going to love to hear this, but to me. The trans the more involved you are in the transfer portal, the more trouble your program's in with talent. Well, it's uh it's le- you're less able to plan your roster um if you're always dipping in the portal. I know it's it's great well, for the first you know, uh, you, you need to build your roster, so it's a great way to build your roster quickly. But then at the end, it's what uh, Tony Ellie actually mentioned it in his press conference. He wants to do more high school recruiting rather than transfer portal recruiting. He wants to be a developmental program. So if you dip too much in the portal, it creates balance issues because you've got high school kids saying, if I go to this school, am I just going to get replaced by a transfer down the line? So it's it's a lot of X factors there. There there are. And the other thing is, like, unless you are going to spend big NIL money, you know, you're not going to get the top flight receiver, the top flight quarterback, the top flight offensive tackle. And if you just – you know, as I as I pay attention throughout a season and then afterward, a lot of the power five to power five transfers are just, you know, depth guys who fill a need but aren't anything special. And I look at, you know, usually a kid leaves a program not because if it's a power five, they usually don't leave the power five because things are going great there and they're having exceptional seasons. And then when you get to kind of like, you know, the the grad transfers or the guys that have been around a little longer, if they were that much of a difference maker, they'd be training for the combine or the NFL draft rather than looking at, I don't fault them. You, you go somewhere, you know, a lot of the Ivy kids are able to go somewhere because the Ivy League, there's no red shirting. So everybody has that usually has that year of eligibility left. And you can go get some money in the NIL world. And if you don't make the NFL, you're, you're still starting out with a pretty healthy bank account coming out of college. And so there's a lot of different reasons in it. But to me, it's it's the expectation level of, of fans a lot of times, I feel like, doesn't meet what the transfer portal actually is. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, the portal can be very hit or miss. Um, it can fill those roster holes, but like you said, you can't really rely on it too much. Um, but Virginia did sign 13 players in high school when it came to early signing day, including a few in-state players, Brian. Um, two of the guys that are on top of the list for the in-state guys are John Rogers, a tight end from Episcopal, and obviously Cameron Courtney, an athlete from Freedom. He was a late flip, flipping day before early signing day. 
what would you kind of grade out this class as far as in-state guys? And what is something that kind of pops when you see Cameron Courtney's film? Well, I, I like Cameron Courtney because he has versatility in terms of receiver and defensive back. He was going to go to Indiana as a defensive back. Um, you know, he, he's comfortable with the ball in his hands. He's going to Virginia, he tells me, probably as a receiver. I know a lot of these kids say they'll look at me on both sides of the ball, but, you know, it's recruiting. It. You could look across college football and count on probably one or two fingers how many people actually play significant snaps on both sides of the ball. But I, I think he's he's a fluid, you know, Cameron's a fluid athlete, um, good kid who will work hard, who likes the offensive side better. So I think it's a good fit. I think it's a good job by UVA of recognizing that there was a chance to move in there after Indiana had a coaching change. And and I like kind of the versatility he brings. And listen, everybody and their mother who's a receiver is now you're the next Malik Washington. You know, it's like at Penn State, they're going to be the next Micah Parsons. And I'm sure at SC, it's going to be the next Caleb Williams. And, you know, there's a reason those guys are special. There's not many of them, but they use it as a recruiting tool, which they should. And so I think, you know, Cameron Courtney is a kid that could probably get on the field early. Um, you know, when we're talking impact, I, I, there's very few freshmen that make big impacts. Um, just getting on the field in the rotation would be huge for him. And John Rogers, the tight end out of a, Episcopal in Alexandria, I like him a lot. I think he's athletic. I think he moves well. He's got a good frame. He's got plenty of room for physical development, strength-wise. Um, and he – Rodgers and Courtney are the kind of kids in-state UVA should be recruiting. And I just think they have to continue. The, the closer the kid is to campus, the better chance you have of keeping him locked in and so um, and, and landing him. And so I think that when you look at Rodgers and Courtney, those are two guys that they should really um, – hopefully they build off of that with the 25 class and the 26 class – just in terms of going harder after in-state kids. Yeah, and also with the with the portal, if you recruit them hard during high school and they happen not to go to your school then, you might have a second chance at them, as Virginia is trying to do in the portal by recruiting guys like Andre Green back home, Tyler Neville back home, um, Chris Tyree back home. Just looking at their transfer class, Brian, a few of those guys from the East who are now returning either back home or returning closer to home. How do you kind of rate Virginia's kind of a process to and to the guys in the portal? I mean, it's, it's it seems like a solid strategy. If you need the guy, go to the guy that maybe wants to come back home. Well, listen, you you bring up a great point, and it's why you know across the country you'll be like man, why is that school sending, spending so much time recruiting that high school kid when you know he has zero chance of going to the school? And you just gave the answer. It's a different world because you may have known you weren't getting Andre Green or, you know, I know the coach have changed with Tyree and everything, but you knew you weren't getting them. But always in the back of your mind, it's, it's like, well, listen, if things don't work out there, if something happens and he needs to come home or – he just wants a fresh start. It's comfortable. There's a relationship. And so it makes complete sense. I mean, when especially, you know, there's very – there's not a lot of programs out there that are just going to go spend the NIL money and they have no connection to a kid, but they're going to get them because they spend the NIL money in the transfer portal. Usually when you're getting kids in the portal, there's some kind of connection. And they used it in a couple of the instances. I mean, Chris Tyree and Andre Green get to play in their home state a few hours. You know, it's not like it's not like Andre Green was far away at North Carolina, but it's still close enough to now where they can really, you know, family can go, friends can go. It, it's just a different vibe. And it's important that guys like Tyree and Green have good experiences because at the end of the day, that they're going to tell other people. You know, you look at Chris Tyree, they got some talent at Thomas Dale, right? They always have talent at Thomas Dale. And, it's, you know, Shamari Earls, who's who's a kid we love in a 
25 class. And if he has a good experience there, he's telling the people back at school, you know, at his high school, what's going on. So there's a lot of good that comes with the portal um, in, in terms of filling holes. But, you know, it's like I, I said before, you just you got to be careful and make sure that um, you're not trying to live in the portal. It's just to, to fill out a roster, not, you know, what's Tony Elliott in year three? This should be really the last year that he should be in the portal really heavily. Um, so, but for me, yeah, I, I think it goes back to what you said. You recruit these kids hard because you may be recruiting them again in two years. And I think the portal also does a good job for kids that might have been sleepers at, at high school or kids that were underdeveloped yet at that point, like Tyler Neville. Uh, he was a tight end that uh, actually loved UVA coming out of high school, but was not offered by Virginia back then, then went to Harvard and developed and then picked up some big offers from UCLA, South Carolina, obviously from Virginia, ended up wanting to come back home and play for the school that he wanted to play for in the first place. I feel like the portal helps him. And I feel like Virginia got a, a very good tight end, a pass catching tight end, which they have been missing. They've been missing that third target on their offense. And I think Tyler Neville was a good guy. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and you look at Tyler Neville. I remember if I'm remembering right, he was telling me he was 190 pounds coming out of high school. So, you know, when when you're doing this stuff and you're rating these kids coming out of high school, you're trying to find out, OK, why did we miss? What happened? Was there an extraneous circumstance? And so you're always trying to learn why maybe something didn't work out. And, and it's the same if you rate a kid too high and he doesn't pan out. And with Tyler Neville, it was just, you know, he knows it. He's like, look, man, I was small. I you know, it's hard to project a 6'3", 190-pound tight end into Power 5 football. And, you know, he gets the chance to go to Harvard, develop physically, spend time in the weight room, um, mature, you know, your body matures. And so now he's ready to go with that size. And, you know, for him, listen, kids get drafted out of the Ivy Leagues, but it's a little different because it's it's not scouted nearly as heavily, obviously, there's still a lot of really good players there. He's mature. He's older. He, he's played a lot of football, so that all helps. And and a kid like him, you know, and, and a lot of the Ivies are, are going into it saying, okay, let me go to UVA and, and let me show them that, okay, this is the stuff they said I need to work on, and can I do it against better competition? And so it, it serves a purpose for him as well. Yeah, Virginia, uh, not only dipping um, in-state for former in-state players to come home, but also in the Ivy League, also picking up Kendron Smith, a, D a DB out of UPenn. But uh, we're going to end with the 2025 class, Brian, because Virginia secured a couple commitments in December um, in that class, starting off with very talented wide receiver Isaiah Robinson from the Richmond area, then going up to Connecticut, <coughs> which they've seen to – be getting some momentum there with Cole Gear and then ending it up with John Adair, offensive lineman out of Nashville. But in the East, John getting Cole Gear and Isaiah Robinson, a quarterback and a talented wide receiver out of Richmond, as your first two commitments, that is that is showing a lot of improvement from what we've seen, you know, this time last year. Yeah, I mean, and, and Isaiah Robinson, you know, he, he had he, he had said she's probably in October that he was going to decide after the season, after his junior season. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't thinking it was UVA and UVA did a good job of staying on him. And, and I, and that's, I, I, when I say, I don't think it was UVA, he didn't think it was UVA either at that time. He just knew he wanted to decide. And UVA did a good job of, you know, staying on him, building relationships, um, showing some progress late in the season with some wins and some close games. Um, I don't think Tony Elliott's at the point of his career where he has to win games to win recruits yet. That may be another year or two away, but this should still be about rebuilding and building relationships. But you see that, and, and he's a big-bodied kid who can play multiple spots. I, I, I like him as a receiver. Again, I remember talking to him about Malik Washington. And then you look at Cole Gear, who – you know, kid from Deerfield Academy who I've seen throw a few times, and he was somebody UVA identified early, offered him, stayed on him. 
He went down to campus and and liked what he saw there. Throws a good ball. You know, he's not out there. He's he's not going to, you know, drive the ball through a brick wall with his arm strength. But he gets rid of it quickly. He's smart. He knows people involved at UVA that speak highly of the program. Um, so to me, it, it, it's a really good start for them. Having that quarterback is important. I know a lot of people talk about transfer poor quarterbacks. And if you go do a quick look at things, you'll, you'll realize fast that unless you have multi years of eligibility as a transfer quarterback, you're, you're not out there killing it. So I think you still have to build through the high school ranks, especially quarterbacks where your development is. And, you know, he, he's, Got a teammate in Tristan Ward who's heading down to Virginia in the 24 class who signed, so um, a receiver. So he's comfortable with that, and he'll he'll be able to, you know, find out from Tristan what life is like at UVA. And you would hope Cole will then be able, you know, there's talent up in the prep schools in New England, and it fits what UVA is academically. So there's a match there, and I would like to see UVA a little more active up there. They you know, they got the kid out of Avon Old Farms in the 24 class also. So I think you continue to build that if you're UVA. Yeah, Virginia is certainly uh, attacking that area. Terry Heffernan and Adam Mims are the two guys who are recruiting that area as, a, as the kind of regional guys uh, uh, there. Um, and I would probably watch out for tight end William Thurber, a 2025 tight end that was yeah. also offered by Virginia. I think Virginia sits in a very good spot for him. He's also from Deerfield Academy. So teammates for both Cogier and Tristan Ward. So um, Virginia certainly putting a lot of effort in those prep schools, which honestly should be their bread and butter, those prep schools and, you know, the, in the Connecticut area, prep schools, honestly, anywhere should Virginia should be like, they're recruiting a Berkeley prep linebacker right now from Tampa, Florida. That should be where they go. Yeah. You know who you are. Right. And so you recruit your state, right? There's no reason that UVA should, they should be very active in Virginia and in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. They, they just should be, um, no doubt about it. But then, you know, when we're, when we're talking about some of these places like Deerfield Academy, it's, you know, it's not just the prep schools, it's the boarding schools. And they, obviously, these kids are huge on academics. Their families are big on academics. We don't really have to talk about, everybody knows what UVA is academically. So there is a match. You just have to recruit them hard, identify them hard, and build relationships. Building relationships. That's uh, that's key for Virginia, who continues to try to establish connections in-state. But, Brian, thanks so much for joining us and kind of talking a little bit about uh, some of the guys that Virginia was able to sign on the first signing day period and kind of look forward as Virginia is set to host more guys, starting with three transfers starting on Thursday. So I appreciate it. And of course, if you like what we're hearing, go ahead and subscribe wherever you listen to the podcast. And if you are watching this on YouTube, go ahead and like our channel. Also like this video and go ahead and leave a review. So I appreciate it and hope you guys have a great rest of your week.